Hey everybody, welcome back to this week's episode of the Career Therapy Podcast. My name is Martin McGovern, founder and lead coach at Career Therapy, and I'm excited to bring you a little bit of a different episode this week. In today's episode, we're going to be sharing with you a live coaching call from a few years back where I help an individual named Terry put some things into context and figure out where his career should go next. If you've ever wondered what it's like to work with a coach, here's a little peek behind the curtain for you. As always, we appreciate you tuning in. And if you have a minute, we're always grateful if you like, subscribe, or share this podcast with a friend. So without further ado, here is my coaching call with Terry. Well, I, I'm really excited to chat with you and continue our conversation that we started last week. Yeah. Um, I guess the the way that we tend to start these things out, um, and I'm, I'm glad we're recording this time because we were starting to get into some really interesting stuff last time we chatted. Yeah. But we didn't get to go too deep. So um, the first thing I'm going to ask you is the most like generic question that you'll ever get asked during an interview yep. that no one enjoys answering. <laughs> and it's not even a real question. So, uh, but it, it's more of a statement and a command. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the command side. <laughs> there it is. And, and I'll just kind of let you go. Um, I, of course, have your notes here that you sent over uh, via email, which we'll touch on throughout the call. But uh, feel free to just kind of relax, um, talk how you would normally talk. If there's anything that you say that you're like, ooh, uh, you know, maybe don't include that for some personal reason. Mm -hmm. uh, Feel free to call it out, but I'll be going through and editing out pretty much anything that's personal, too too personal, or would give away who you are, where you live, things like that. Sure. Um, so feel free to speak freely, and uh, I will just kind of hand it over and say, tell me about yourself. Well, um, well, going back is as I mentioned earlier. You know, I grew up in a little town called Dwight. Um, Illinois, which is uh, like 4,200 people. So of course, the town there, everybody knows your name and um, lived there till I was about 19, 20, give or take, and then kind of moved out after I had finished um, um, working at a job at the time. I was kind of going to college and working a, or managing a, a bar and restaurant pizza place type thing. Um, and then once I got done with college, I moved out and headed up towards closer to the Chicagoland area. And I basically uh, took the first job for the most part that I was offered um, when I graduated, which was um, an opportunity to, to start in the paper business uh, at the time. And it was a opportunity to kind of step in and, you know, really learn the business. I mean, the first, I think almost three years, I worked a third shift, uh, eventually moving into a second shift. And then of course the first shift. So I, my first five to seven years, I, w I basically spent my whole entire time learning the paper business. Um, and then, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, it, I, it just kind of, you know, kind of grew on me and I enjoyed it now and, and I was, I was good at it. And, um, I held a couple different roles in logistics and distribution and, and, um, you know, managing employees and, and, and everything that kind of goes into the distribution business. Um, and I, and I ended up staying with the, the, the same company and it changed a couple different names, but I stayed with the whole company up until a year ago, um, which, you know, you kind of look at it, is it good or is it bad? Um, you know, I, I try to look at everything just kind of with my upbringing and kind of the things I've been through. I, I try to look at everything and, and, you know, what, what did I learn and what, what was, you know, and what, you know, what's been good and, and, you know, what did I have to continue to work at my, you know, work on myself at, um, a lot of great experiences. Um, basically, like I said, starting in supply chain logistics, um, going into, uh, sales and marketing the last couple of years in the corporate environment. Uh, so all said and done, I had 21 years with the same company and, you know, pretty much cover the entire gamut from supply chain, uh, to, like I said, uh, the last couple of years in the marketing, which I really, really enjoyed, uh, the entire time. But then, you know, I have to be honest, you know, I, 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 I spent about four, almost five years in the corporate environment. Um, I'm glad I did it. it. You know, it was one of those things where it, when it, when the opportunity came, I had a lot of people calling me saying, do you really know what you're doing? You know, cause I had spent my entire career in the field. Um, so I heard all the horror stories about working in corporate and, you know, and this and that. And I thought, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of hitting a wall here. Um, I need to do something different. And I look, always look at it as every opportunity is a challenge. So mm -hmm. I'm glad I did it. I mean, the first couple of years were tough. You know, I went from, for the most part, having leadership roles, you know, managing people, managing teams, um, 
And these teams are the ones that got me to where I was at at that point. I mean, they're only as good as the people behind you. And, and I've always believed that you, you look at great leaders, talk to the people that work for them or, or are behind them and you'll get the real story. Um, and so I went from, you know, those leadership roles into technically an individual contributor role in the corporate environment. Mm -hmm. and, and truthfully, I would tell you that's that was one of my toughest challenges from a career standpoint was was trying to adjust to that where, where I couldn't pull the levers anymore. I couldn't, you know, help people the way I did and pick up the phone and, you know, make things happen. It was kind of I was in a, in a role that I just kind of had to learn to work within the team and realize I just didn't have that. You know, I, I hate the word power. I'll say control to make things happen in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, so the first couple of years were kind of rough, but, you know, I kind of I stuck through it. I was thankful I had some good mentors that were already there that kind of helped me along. You know, and and and, I, and again, I had a couple of different opportunities in there, and and the last, as I mentioned, I think a couple of times, I, I ended up the last couple of years in marketing. Um, but even with that, I got to the point where it was like, you know, I, I'm still in my 40s. I still have really another runway from a career standpoint. You know, and and there's a lot of truth to some people say corporate is corporate. I mean, you know, the company I work for is a uh, it's a great company. It's a very old company, um, and to some degrees. They, you know, they, they stick to what's worked for them. So, you know, as far as innovation and, you know, doing things outside the box, so to speak, that was a, that kind of put people on their heels a little bit, um, understandably, for all the right reasons. And I, and for me, it was just like, I, I don't want to be stuck in this cubicle, cubicle and doing the same old thing over and over and over again. So I, what I chose to do was um, um, I decided to really just step away from all of it. I talked to my boss at the time and I told him that, you know, I just, I wasn't feeling, it, it wasn't really working for me. Um, and I, I did look for some other options, but I, again, as I evaluated everything, I thought to myself, it's not going to be any different no matter what world I take. Um, so I thought, you know, if there's an opportunity to part ways in a good way, um, I would like to do it. And, you know, I was grateful for them. They, you know, they, I, I got a good severance for the years I was there and, you know, they, they helped me out in a couple of different areas. And I packed my bags and went from, uh, um, Memphis, Tennessee down to, uh, Miami, Florida. Um, yeah. so it was a big move and, you know, people say, well, why'd you go to Miami for? It's like, well, I, I've lived in Chicago. I've lived in Wisconsin. I love the water. And, you know, and I have, you know, personal relationships down here that I thought, you know, it, it's a good way to just kind of, OK, step away and really figure out what I want to do next. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what I did. I basically, you know, once I uh, decided that what my last day was within a couple months, I was down in my down here in Miami. And, you know, I took some time off, you know, to really kind of just soul search, as they say, and and to really think about, you know, really what I want to do next. Um you know, and I, I did some help volunteering, you know, I, I, you know, I've always been good at, you know, um, kind of redoing houses and things like that. So I did that on the side for a while too. And then, you know, I, and as I think, I, I think I touched on in our last discussion, um, I think the hardest thing I've had to go through right now in, in my career, it actually is this right now is figuring out, well, what does, do I want to do next? Um, you know, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of roles that I really did enjoy. You know, I could say I got up every morning and I never dreaded it or it's like, oh, God, it's this over and over again. I really enjoyed the, the, the job perspective of what I did. And so I think it makes it harder when you've been successful in a lot of different things to say, well, what is it? You know, I, I'm not a big person on the word passion because I think we uh -huh. all have so many different passions. You can't define it into one. You know, this is my passion. This is what I'm going to do. I think you're going to be stronger in certain ones, but we all have various passions. And so it really started to kind of, you know, it was it was really hard for me to, to say, you know, you know, yeah, I'm good at all these things. But will it give me that fulfillment over the next 15 to 18 years or whatever it may be? And where's the value I can add? You know, somebody once asked me, well, and, and I'm sure you've heard this before, is that if you could do it all over again, what would you want to do? Mm. I, and I can tell you, I would tell you right now, if there's one thing I could do, I would love to be a motivational speaker like Tony Robbins. I'm, and mm. I, know he, I know he gets a lot of negative press and things of that nature, but 
I always look at, look what he's done for so many people and look what, how long he's been doing it. I remember having his original tapes, you know, when I was a teenager listening oh, yeah. to, but yeah, to um, his tapes at that time, you know, the cassette tapes at the time of, and, and, and again, I've always been a firm believer with motivational speakers. If you strip away the charisma or whatever goes with that, there really is basic fundamentals on motivating people. You know, well, of course. you got to understand them. You know, it gets back to, I think it's no different than managing and leading people. You just, you know, guys like Tony Robbins and Les, Ro- or Les uh, Russ, I think it's Les Russell, um, you know, the guys like that are just able to really feel like you're the most important person they're talking to. And and, so, and I think that to some degree is a gift. Um, but the basics of motivation, I don't, I think are the same for everybody. It's just what makes, what works for you as far as what makes you tick um, and what, you know, what, what drives you, what makes you happy. And a lot of it comes down to belief. And this is actually something that I was reading quite a bit about medically as well. If you don't believe in a treatment, it doesn't work as well. Yeah. And that idea of like people use the placebo effect as like a negative. It's like, oh, we have to account for the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. But actually it's like, no, that is your body's ability or your brain's ability to overcome things. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in your in your write up that you had filled out early on, you talk a little bit about your childhood and, and the things you've kind of figured out in therapy and you mentioned, you know, you you have a number of things right now that we've been talking about. The first one is a little bit of a fear of failure yep. um, from your from your past. Yep. You have uh, layered on top of that an, a, a knowledge and a really strong self understanding <sighs> that you're good at a lot of things, which yes. makes the possibilities pretty endless, right? Right. So. You have the fear of failure plus the um, just wide open opportunities in front of you. Uh, we talked quite a bit uh, in our little intro call about, um, you know, that that sort of paralyzing feeling that comes with so many opportunities. Right. And then, um, you know, we talked about your great mentality that you have around success and passion because it's not so much trying to find the thing that will fulfill you every moment of every day and make you blissfully happy. It's mm-hmm. about finding something that is going to capture your attention and keep you excited as you continue to move down this path. And what I'm actually picking up from what you're saying in this intro is also this idea that um, you want to have that immediate gratification and feedback from the work you're doing. And maybe you've been missing some of that in the past. And I know from my own work in marketing, a lot of times it's so far removed from the actual person you help at the end of the day that maybe you don't get that um, you know, tactile, personal interaction feedback to see the, let's say, results of your work, right? And so when you say yeah, you're a motivational yeah. speaker, part of what that means to me is you want to be able to see people benefiting from the yeah. effort you're putting in. Yeah. Is that is that correct? Are we moving I, right? I think you, I, I think you just nailed it. And you know, I'll give you a real quick small example is, you know, again, the corporate environment, again, it, it, it can be... For, take example, you know, interns come and go. And, mm-hmm. you know, I used to sit in my office and I'd see them bring these interns in and they were all starry eyed. And, you know, then we would put them in a corner and, and have them do reports. And so to me, it was always about the ones that were on my floor. I would reach out to them and, you know, and, and just get to know them, understand why they chose the career they did or understand, you know, why, you know, what are your thoughts of here and why did you do things? And, and I was very blessed to have a couple of people that, I was able to just through discussion and getting to know them, help them really find out what they really wanted to do. I mean, do you Mm -hmm. want to come in and be an analyst and sit in a cubicle or do you want to go work in the forestry because you lead a church group or you like going on um, um, things with your church and leading, you know, people in in your church group in whether it's hiking or camping or things of that nature. And this is a real example. But but do what you do, what you do, what makes you happy, not what people tell you you should do. And, you know, and I think the corporate, the corporate world, you can get sucked into, well, this is what I want you to do. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I think it's good maybe earlier in your career to be exposed to that. But eventually you got to decide what is best for you and what makes you happy in what you do. Not because somebody tells you, well, I want you to take this role or I think you should take this role. Are you happy in what you're doing? And what you just hit on is exactly right. To me, to watch somebody say, you know what, I'm so glad we had these conversations. Here's what I've decided to do. It's just immediate gratification. I just that that's what makes me happy is I've helped somebody else, you know. Absolutely. And again, that, that a lot of that comes from my childhood too. I mean, there's a lot of things that 
made me who I am, especially when it comes to people, that gives me that gratification. And and I love where you're going with this. And one of the things that we brought up on our last call was the idea of the hierarchy of three. And so the hierarchy of three is, are you in the in this next phase of your career development? Are you focused on uh, a certain skill set you want to develop? Are you focused on a certain financial number that you need to maintain or, or increase? Or are you focused on being around certain people or a culture? Mm-hmm. And those are three very distinct things. And it's not like any, any of them don't matter. It's right. just what priority do we put them in at this phase in our life? And so I'm curious because from what we were saying in, in some of your previous work, you know, maybe financial was at the top at certain times. Maybe skill set was at the top at certain times. How would you rank those three things today? Um, I would I would rank them um, with people being first. Um, I will tell you that, like you had said, initially, you know, it comes to mind. I think this is probably human nature. Well, yeah, financially it needs to be first because I got to make money. And I think there's a small truth to that. I've never for me personally, it's never, ever been about the money. I mean, to mm-hmm. me, it's money is third or fourth on the list because I've never, I mean, I live within my means and all that kind of good stuff. I don't need a lot of money. So it's not a driver in what I do, which I think makes makes it easier to make decisions. Um, so I would put the people part first. I mean, I think I would probably put financial second and then skill set. But I tell you, even those two are very, very close. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, I mean, I haven't, you know, I've been out of the workplace force for a year now. So, I mean, again, I, I I don't want to keep burning my pension, so to speak. So financially right. has to kind of play in there a little bit. Um, right. Well, and, and that's why I want to be clear. These three things, it doesn't mean that none of them matter. It just yeah. means that if you're put in a situation between two jobs, one pays more, but the other has a better culture. Would you choose the culture over the pay? Culture. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. not, so, yeah. so I think we're in a good spot. So, I mean, obviously, we all need to survive, right? Right. Um, and I wouldn't recommend you go work for free at, at this point in your career. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so when you're thinking about culture and people, so you say culture and people is first. What have been the cultures or the people that you've worked with um, or that you imagine working with? If maybe there's nothing that comes to mind from your immediate past, but who have been the people that you've enjoyed working with the most, either in a professional or even a volunteer setting. Ooh, well, you just threw kind of a you threw a wild card in there with the volunteer. Um, you know, one of the things I, I I did when I was at the corporate spot is I volunteered at a um, children's hospital, and I can tell you that. And again, uh, back to that whole relationship to my childhood, the children's hospital was probably the most gratifying thing I think I've ever done was being able to help those kids. Now that was all volunteer. Um, Great people really had a passion for helping the children, which, you know, people would say, well, yeah, yeah, they better. But you'd be surprised sometimes. Um, so that 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 the volunteering experience was really satisfying for me now to take it into the true career or the work world. You know, I, one of the things I used to tell, you know, people I used to work with in the corporate environment is if you really want to understand people, go manage in the field. And what I would mean by that is, is I was kind of coming through the ranks. Um, you know, when you're managing truck drivers and warehouse personnel and people who, who a lot of them barely are, who live check to check, if you really have a, you, you really need to have an understanding and you really need to care about people in order to, to lead them and put any definition, definition you want around leadership. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is, is if, if somebody knows you truly care about them, they may not believe or may not agree with some of the decisions you make, some of the discussions you have with them, but they'll always walk away knowing that, you know what, I know he cares about me. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with him. So those experiences in the field were some of the best I ever had because I had to grow myself. You know, I was a kid coming out of college. You know, who is this guy? He's looking at costs and savings. And, you know, there was a couple of years there where I had to, I had to lick my wounds because, you know, when surveys and polls came out, I, I got lambasted, as they say. Mm. But I, I was fortunate to have people who coached me along the way. And I learned so much from that. And the bottom line is, is that it really in, in certain environments, you just got to have a genuine caring about people. And if you do, I think it makes the job much easier. Now, taking a step into corporate, that was good learning, too. But for the corporate world, to me, just isn't can, can seem that it's just not real. 
It's like I used to tell people, the closer you get to it, it's like a mirage. The closer you get to mm-hmm. it, the more, you, the more you realize it's not what you thought it was. Good, bad, or indifferent, it's just a different world. Yeah. And so what, one of my biggest challenges that I, I continued to have was I just couldn't be who I was. You know, you say something that somebody spins it and takes it, well, that's not right, or I'm aligned with this person, and all that kind of stuff that it, to me is just distractions, and it, it, it doesn't allow you just to be who you are. And, you know, and there were and there was a handful of years there when I was younger that I thought I was going to be an MMA fighter. I actually did amateur cage fighting for like, or, uh, for like a wow. year. Yeah, I gave it a shot. Um, I did some amateur fights, and I loved the aspect of competition. Um but during that time, and even to this day, you know, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu is something that I've always loved and always enjoyed. But it was the the people within the groups that I loved the most. I mean, it was mm-hmm. always like a family. And, and even when I would teach it. Or, Very focused on leadership and, like, yeah, and yeah. mentorship and things like that. Yeah, it really was. And so those experiences kind of all together. And, and I kind of go back to that one fundamental, though, is you got to care about people. In some way, shape, or form, you have, have to have a genuine caring about people and, and not and, and to be authentic in who you are in order to be a good leader. And I think, again, like I say, those people helped me get to a certain point in my career where I had to make decisions, but it was because of them is why I made I was successful in what I was doing. Right. And so as I'm listening to what you're saying, a few things stand out. The first thing is, you know, you had this amazing experience at the Children's Hospital. Yeah. Um, there could be opportunities to do some marketing work with hospitals, whether it's in a contract position, things like that. Um, but that's one route we could go down. Another route, though, that kind of pops out as you're saying all these things is it doesn't necessarily you, you don't necessarily need to be in a medical environment or something like that where you're getting that really just clear, direct um, line to you know someone who's sick and you're helping them with your work. Mm-hmm. It could be that you're just working on a team that is very heavily focused on mentorship and community and like, you know, group dynamics and things like that. So there could be maybe some startups or different things like that that we could look into that are a bit more on like the let's all work together, build a real tight knit team kind of mindset. Um, When you're thinking, you know, you you left your last job and you said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to go figure this out. Right. And, And then you sort of realize, wow, this is maybe one of the hardest things I've ever encountered in my life is trying to figure this out. Um, what has that journey been like from making that decision to like the highs of thinking you had it and then maybe some of the lows of being like, wow, that didn't work out. Can you kind of walk me through that journey a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, of course the first few months you're kind of on that honeymoon, so to speak phase. And yeah. And like I say, the time it was interesting because I came down during the hurricane, right after the hurricane that hit Miami. Wow. And so, I, you know, the, the end of the end of last year, I basically spent time, you know, helping a couple of my friends, um, you know, basically doing what I could just to help others. Um, and I really, honestly, I really didn't even start thinking about, well, what do I want to do next until February of this year? Mm-hmm. Um, but I will tell you the, probably the, Miami is not a very easy city to, number one, start a second career. Uh, number two, not be a local. And number three, to, to, to one would argue to be a minority. You know what I mean? It's just, it's very hard. And, and others will tell you, and they've told me, and I've been fortunate that I have a lot of friends. A lot of them are Hispanic. It's a tough world to just step into with basically having nothing, you know, no, mm-hmm. no, no, no lineage, no connections, no network, you name it. So, you know, I, I probably would have thought differently. Now, again, as I mentioned, my, you know, my girlfriend is down here. So, you know, I, and I and I've, I met a lot of people in my prior role uh, before I left. I was I spent a lot of time down here. So I got to know a lot of people and they've been they've been wonderful and great. But the reality is, is it's it's tough. Um, and so I think for, for me, it, I, you know, and again, and I keep referencing the same thing, but going back to, you know, kind of how I've been on my own arguably since I was one would argue since I was two um, mm-hmm. but I would say since I was 11 when I was working in a pizza place for cash and I was running with a group of people that probably weren't the best people in the world but they were my family and they protected mm-hmm. they protected me looked out 
So you learn, I've learned that I just don't let things get me down. I mean, do I get up some mornings and say, oh my God, it's been, you know, 13 months or I get up some mornings like, oh my God, I got four months left to go on my health insurance or, you know, oh my God, it's like nobody has called me back on my resumes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that that is always there, but I don't dwell on it. I get up every day at the, roughly the same time. I, I get ready like I'm going somewhere and I do something for myself, you know, as far as like, like right now what I'm doing with you, or I've been taking some online courses uh, th through for data analytics through Wharton. I don't allow the negative part of this, you know, linger in my mind very long. And I just stay as positive as I can. And, and I'm a big believer in, in faith and hope. And, and you got to trust sometimes. And, you know, it, it, I, I knew going into this, it was not going to be easy before I knew what I got into. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I had kind of planned. It's not like I, I went off and said, well, you know what, I'm out of here. Screw everything, and I'm, I'm just going to go do this and that. You know, I was in the back of my mind already kind of planning financially and just my mindset probably a year before it all shook down and, and the opportunity came where I could walk away. Um, so I kind of mentally prepared, um, but it's still, it, you know, you deal with those, you know, you still think to yourself, okay, it, it's going to be pretty tough to find something down here. All right, now I got to probably start looking maybe Fort Lauderdale, maybe West Palm Beach, maybe Tampa, maybe Orlando. Maybe even the Carolinas, you know what I mean? And expanding to find that opportunity. I mean, either I can be stuck down in one little location down in Miami and, you know, woe is me and I can't find anything. Or I, I have to, do, you got to do something different. I mean, mm -hmm. again, like the old saying of what's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, right. expecting, expecting, you know, a different result. So, well, so let's get a little bit more into the specifics. What exactly have you been applying to? What are the things that you, like job title? And, and the way we break this down and we're trying to get specific is location, title, yeah. industry. Okay. So when you break those three things down, you're looking in your location, right? Yes. Um, what title and what industry are you focused on right now? Um, the titles, and again, it's, it started out, I want you know, I spent the last – three years in that marketing role, which I really, really enjoyed. But that's all I had was that particular three years in marketing, you know, no degree, no nothing. Where the flip side is I spent the prior, what, 17 years, give or take, in some type of supply chain distribution, logistics, you name it. And I have a degree and I have certifications and I've got my MBA. So when I started out, I started for the marketing side. So it was, you know, and, 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 I'm, and I'm realistic too. I would not expect to step into a director of marketing role. So my focus was on like a brand manager, um, even a marketing analyst. You know, to me, again, kind of back to, you know, for the right opportunity, I would step into a role that some would say, well, that's a step down for you to learn the business, to, to learn like a, a data a marketing analyst. It's pro you probably don't find a better way to learn the learn a business than through an analytical job to some degree mm -hmm. um so between brand manager um you know marketing manager anything around that marketing manager type title um mm -hmm. i'm sure there's a couple i'm sure there's a couple more out there but then i also again kind of going back to well uh, you know it, it may be tough so look at supply chain which to me again back to what i had said earlier is i really enjoyed the supply chain aspect i mean but the next role I would consider would I would hope to be a bigger role, like a, you know, a director of supply chain or a regional supply chain manager, something at, at that kind of scale um, that, ha, you know, oversees multiple facilities. And, and then adding into I also considered a general manager where, you know, can I use all my skill sets, you know, managing people, being part of marketing, being part of supply chain, you know, whatever it might entail under a gen, general manager role. Um, with the right of company. So kind of some different, different avenues. So I had to kind of, kind of tweak my resumes, of course, as you can imagine, you know, three different resumes um, mm -hmm. to get that, you know, to, to make sure I had the right resume. And, and that was a bit of a challenge because it was kind of like, kind of back to when I first did my resume and had some people, had some individuals look at it before I had it tweaked a little bit. Um, kind of the comment was, well, there's a lot of good stuff on here, but it doesn't really tell me what you want to do. And I kind of already knew that, but I didn't know how to fix it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So, so it was just like, yeah, I know that. I just, it's just kind of back to the struggle of what do I want to do? Exactly. And yeah. that's really where I want to dig in here. Where are you at with the idea of building your own projects and doing some of your own let's say personal branding and things of that sort, since we are talking about getting into marketing 
And part of that is going to be um, marketing yourself. And what we talked about earlier on in the call is that you had multiple things that you were trying to do and people said that they could see you were a bit scattered, right? Mm -hmm. So as we move towards getting less scattered and being more focused, um, what are your thoughts around blogging, uh, around, because you said you want to be a speaker too. Uh, you said that would be a really cool thing as well. So what are your thoughts around creating content, creating platforms, or just working within the social platforms that exist? What, what's your current comfort level and, and where do you hope to get with that? Um, I, you know, I'm fairly comfortable with it. I mean, again, I, I've never written a blog or, you know, I have commented on products and gave my two cents. I mean, I, I enjoy doing that, um, but it's minimal. You know, I'll be being honest, it's very minimal. And I have thought about that. I mean, the whole social media perspective, I mean, in general, you know, it is, it's where we're at today. Um, and it's a huge opportunity, I think. And again, I, I would tell you, I probably shied away from it because I don't have the experience. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I, but I, but like, I don't know if you saw what Payless did um, the last few weeks about what they did from a marketing perspective. I find that fascinating. What they do? Uh, the, they did, the, and actually Wharton did a study on this thing. They, what they did is they, they basically rented out Payless Shoe Store. You know Payless, their shoes mm -hmm. are like 20 bucks. Well, they, they, they hired a, a designer and they came out with this new line of shoes and they're in the stores right now. And before the launch, what they did is they rented out a space in LA that was in, a, it was a space that was within all these designer boutiques, you know, and some high ends uh, designer, um, uh, like purses and all that kind of good stuff. And they had people come in and redesign it to make it look like this really, really high end boutique. Put the shoes up like you'd find at a place you pay $1,000 a pair of shoes. And mm -hmm. it was really designer focused. And then they invited all these social media influencers and all these designers and invited them and said, hey, we got this new designer coming in. They've redesigned, you know, he's redesigned the shoes. We want you to come in and check them out. And you can look it up on YouTube. There's a, there's a couple of short excerpts. But also, you know, to make the story short is they invited, they had this big kickoff, this big red carpet deal. And, and, they, and, they, and they filmed all these designers commenting on how the quality of these shoes and <laughs> how trendsetters they become and and they literally were paying two four six eight hundred dollars a pair for these shoes and then once they paid they basically told them they were duped yeah and so and some people look at this as like there's really a couple of things but first off the consumers really don't understand the quality when it comes to especially clothes and shoes and things of that nature they really don't know the difference i mean they've got one of the designers and i can't think of his name but basically looking at a tennis shoe to say you know this is some of the best quality i've ever seen it's right. a 20 dollars shoe <laughs> all said and done yeah exactly and then there's you know there's a couple of the fashion divas that are just like i just love them and and so they've made a commercial out of it and the commercial lens you know it shows them to pay in two four six eight hundred why would you pay that when you can pay 1995. exactly you know it, it was fantastic to me and it tells the truth a lot of it was because of social media you put you know it's like i was telling a friend of mine's daughter the other day and i can't remember what she was talking about it was some jacket and how you know she wouldn't buy it i said i can tell you right now if kim kardashian came out saying this is one of the best jackets i've ever worn that jacket just ran out of stock yeah because of the social media influence and the people behind it i find it fascinating to me and so back to your point that's a long-winded that's why i do have interest in it because it, it really is the future so <laughs> this is exactly where i wanted to get with this stuff because i think where we're headed with this conversation is for you to start positioning yourself as a brand, um, a branding expert online and taking stories like the one you just told me and retelling it with your perspective. And whether you do that with a blog, white papers, um, just writing articles on LinkedIn, whatever it is you want to do, there's a lot of different ways that we can do it. Um, you want to, if you're going to be in this brand marketing space, uh, positioning yourself as someone who not only understands brands and what they're trying to do, but also has their own brand and can manage their own online presence. So as we dig into this a little bit more, um, the fun part about it is that you get to choose right now what you want to focus on, whether it's... Um, brands in general, whether it's a certain industry. And I would say it's better to start specific and then go broad than to start broad and go specific. Um, but what sort of stands out to you? Like you, you mentioned Payless. 
I'm sure there's lots of other examples like that out there. Um, as we kind of keep digging and peeling away at the onion, what sort of stands out to you as, as something that you might be able to develop or create? Does anything pop into your head that would really help position you for this next phase? As far as um, what to talk about, so to speak, is that what you're asking? Like what, um, like could an be, industry? It could be topic, it could be platforms, yeah. So okay. is, is there a certain thing that you feel like you could, you know, you could dissect endlessly, let's say? Yeah, yeah that one, I, I'm not sure I can answer that out right off the top of my head. Um, I, I mean, I think to myself, there's a lot of stuff that I have, of course, I have an opinion or thought about of why it's successful. Um, I, I guess, and I know this is going to be broad, um, I guess I lean towards my interest level as, as to why why consumers buy certain things. Why do... You know, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, and I go back to, you know, I, I write Harley Davidson. Harley mm-hmm. Davidson to me is the ultimate brand. When, when you're putting a tattoo on your body, and one would argue Nike is the same way, but there's certain brands that they have such a following that it doesn't matter that even the cost, they will not sway from what they f- believe in. So why, you know, why is that? And how do you get them to sway? And, and how do you convince consumers to try some? You know what I mean? So I, I know I'm probably getting very broad on this, but I'm but I'm also not trying to just pull stuff off my head that, you know, I think I, I, I have things to say about a certain product or brand. Don't worry about it. I love okay. it. I, this is exactly <laughs> what I want you to be doing. So don't feel like you're doing the wrong thing. Uh, I want us to get really up in the clouds and then I'll, you know, strain out the rain. Okay. Well, I guess, um, again, I'm going to lean back on probably my hobby slash interests, um, you know, kind of back to, you know, of course I follow the MMA junkie and I follow, it's interesting because I, I read the, the blogs that people write about certain fights and why people are, you know, why certain people might win, they might win. And of course I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it enough that I can disagree or agree mm-hmm. um, or why certain, certain, you know, why, why don't certain um, uh, designer or not designers, but clothes manufacturers, you know, why can't they be part of the UFC or Bellator or, you know, some of these other organizations, you know, cause usually stuff sometimes, well, they've got new sponsors and these are the sponsors. Well, why is that? You know, I've got a friend of mine that owns his own company in Milwaukee called Combat Corner. Been around for 15 years. You know, why can't he, you know, why can't they give him an opportunity? You know what I mean? So all those things, uh, I think I'm, I'm kind of getting off track a little bit. No worries. I love it. I think we're actually hitting on it really well. So you mentioned Harley Davidson and you said you, you ride a Harley. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, right. I've had one for years. Awesome. So really what I'm seeing this all kind of build around Everything that we're talking about today, from your interest in Tony Robbins throughout the years, through um, your interest in Harley and Payless and things like that, this idea of belief marketing. People want to believe in something. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we've been talking about today, um, especially like music and things along those lines, comes down to this idea of like really feeling something, having a connection belonging or maybe it's yeah belonging marketing things like that how do these things ring in your ears and what are your thoughts around them Uh, that you you actually just nailed it and i go back to and i actually saved the project i was working on with the la designer around authenticity i mean that was going to be the name of that weekend get together was authenticity um and i know that's a word that i think some people will say well yeah it's kind of not cliche but yeah it's overused it's not to me personally it's not used enough that's the problem mm-hmm. with our society is people aren't authentic anymore and i think to some degree social media has is, has been somewhat of a, a a problem with that because you know especially down here in miami i think you really see mm-hmm. the, the effects of you know, I mean, again, you got a culture stigma there too, which doesn't help. But the reality is, is you know, what, what, you know, why aren't you driving that car? Well, I don't want a lease payment. I own my own car. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, but you need to be. You know what I mean? So, so, 
so the, the whole belonging and the belief, you know, also to me, it still comes back to you have to be an authentic. If people think you're – people know you're an authentic person, I think they have a tendency to believe in what you're trying to do. They may not buy your product, but they may li- – but they might listen to you versus right. if they think you're full of whatever, they, you, they might not give you a time of day. But how do you – and I always use this. Well, how do you convince or convey that like when you're standing in an ele- elevator? When you get off that elevator for whatever floor, that person walks away and there's something about you that made them think about, you know what, I'm going to call that person or it resonates. You know what I mean? There's just something there that they they have a little bit of belief in you. So to your point, I love it. Belonging, belief, whatever you want to call it. I, I And I think honestly, and again, I, I'm, I don't get into politics with anybody. I think we're in a world right now and it starts with the presidency on the way down and everything that's happening that – People need to, they need to believe in something because there's just a lot of negativity around this world that it, it's making it very hard for people to believe anymore. And I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent there, and it's probably a little far-fetched, but I, I do think there's some truth in what you just said. All right. I love this. I'm, I'm going to pull out a statement here in a second and see how it, how it sounds to you. I'm kind of putting together a little bit of a pitch for you. All right. Every company can tell you what they stand for, but I help you show it and get your customers to believe in it. Can you say that again to me? Every company can tell you what they stand for. I help companies show their beliefs or show what they stand for and get customers to believe in it. I got you. I like it. I like it. So when someone says, you know, what is it that you do? Tell me about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways we can come back at that. But the core thing that you want to do is help people believe in the brands that they interact with. And this is actually one of the reasons why you really enjoyed working with the Children Hospital. You enjoy working there because you believe that they're helping people. You believe in their mission. Yeah. You believe in the people that are doing that mission because it's volunteer based. No one's there for the paycheck. Everyone's there to try and help. And your belief in this being an ultimate good was there. Yeah. Yeah. So much so that you're able to give your own time. And what you want to do is help people believe in everything that they support as much as you believe in this children's hospital. Mm-hmm. And you look at things like the MMA and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's more than just fighting. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a group. It's belonging. It's um you know masters training apprentice uh, 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 I'm not saying the word right apprentices. Or amateurs. Um, yeah. Amateurs. Yeah. It's like there is this trust that is built. People right. make sure that you're able to do the things that you're able to do because you can get really hurt if you don't do things correctly. Yeah. Um, you're really like. The brands that you've enjoyed the most, or, and even when you're working in the paper industry, what you enjoyed the most was this collaboration with music because people believe in music. It has a serious impact in their lives and their personal lives. You and, just you just nailed exactly what Lawrence said the first time I met him. The design I just threw his name out there. Sorry, uh, the designer that I work with. You you just, word for word is exactly the first thing he told me about the music industry. You nailed it. Amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And I think that that's really what we want to dig into today is what do you believe in? How do you communicate what you believe in with other people so that they can see it? And then how do you work with these brands that you believe in the most? Mm-hmm. That's what we want to get to. And so we've really gotten in deep here with what it is you want to be doing. You want to be working in brand marketing. You might need to spend a little bit of time getting more specific about the actual job title. Right. But brand marketing, not sales, not anything else, brand marketing. And and brand marketing includes analytics. Mm -hmm. Um, You want to work for brands similar to Harley Davidson, MMA, Etc. These lifestyle brand companies, mm-hmm. and I would say go deep into each one of those, one at a time. So say I want to be a brand manager at Harley Davidson. 
Now you're going to look at Harley <laughs> Davidson, all of their collaborators and competitors. You're going to build that map of everyone. You know, you can get about 100 companies out of like okay. looking at their competitors and collaborators. And you go down to the bottom. You try and meet and talk to as many people that work at Harley Davidson as you can or any of the companies that partner with them as you can. And you want to get as close as you can. You might not get Harley Davidson right off the bat. But you can get, you know, the person that the company that supplies the tires or something. I'm not sure who that is. Well, the good thing is, is um, I have a colleague that uh, actually is in he's the director of communication in Milwaukee that he was in my MBA class. So I have a connection. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Like so, right there. Yeah. Once we start getting specific, it becomes very clear who we need to talk to and what we need to talk to them about. OK. No, that's good. I mean, I, I do. I mean, again, I wouldn't just I would probably look elsewhere as well. Like you say, it'd be interesting to get some different perspectives. But I know I could probably get a very quick inroad to Harley Davidson themselves to understand the brand manager, you know, role or what Absolutely. I have. Absolutely. And this gotcha. is what's beautiful once you understand an industry, right? Even just the motorcycle industry by itself, right? Yeah. The motorcycle industry, anyone who owns a motorcycle is risking their life to <laughs> enjoy yeah, this product. Yeah. So like. They're committed no matter it, it could be any of the companies and the people are just as enthusiastic, maybe not Harley Davidson tattoo my back enthusiastic, right, but they right. love their bikes. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so you can find it's it's really it's not so much the singular brand, although you have a goal. One day I'd love to work for Harley. Um, it's I'm going to talk with every single company that's involved in the motorcycle industry and I'm going to become the most knowledgeable brand person in this space. And I'll give you a quick example of how that can look. Okay. I was working with someone who wanted to get into the internet of things, right? Yeah. So they could say, oh, I want to work for Bosch or I want to work for any number of companies creating smart mirrors or whatever the heck else, right? Roomba. And what they ended up doing was they got coffee with a dozen people that work in the internet of things industry. Some people did the sensors. Some people built the washing machines. Some people did X, Y, and Z, right? All sorts of different folks. Some people were marketers. Some people were coders. The, the, the point here is that after five conversations, they were the smartest person about the internet of things mm -hmm. because everyone else they were talking to had a single perspective mm -hmm. and they already had five different company perspectives on that industry. Uh, yeah, gotcha. So you Good. talk to 12 people who work in the motorcycle industry, by the time you talk to the, you know, the chief marketing officer at Harley, you're going to go into that conversation saying, Hey, I I've seen how Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi does it. I've seen how, you know, BMW mm -hmm. does it. And I love the way you're doing it because. Right. And now they're like, wow, who is this person? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe you've written a couple articles on LinkedIn's, um, you know, posting like medium thing. Maybe you have a blog, maybe you have a YouTube channel, whatever the thing is that you want to do. Maybe it's an Instagram, but something that they can, when they Google you, it pops up that, wow, this person is so interested that they've even written about this. You know? Right. Yep. Yep. And now you are becoming known. Yeah. And, and again, it's not like, oh, we're going to build a massive following of hundreds of thousands of people and become, I don't know, whatever the key person in the industry or something. You're not trying to be a, a necessarily a voice in the industry right now. You're just trying to be a voice in the industry right now. Yeah. So instead of being like whoever the voice in the industry is, maybe someday we'll get there. Right. But right now we aren't a voice. We just want to be a voice. And then as we get more and more intertwined in the in the community, we just get louder and louder if that's what we want to do. Okay. And again, this could go up. This could go down. You don't always have to be doing a blog if it's not your thing. But when you're in the job search process, you want to have some sort of project that you're working on on top of the job search so that when someone asks you the question, what have you been doing the past six months? Yeah, you can say something other than searching for a job. Yeah, it has. And I, yeah, again, I'd heard that elsewhere, too. And that's where I have to go in and, you know, kind of just redo my current LinkedIn profile as well as my resume, because technically, my, you know, I, have I been doing things? Yeah, I've been kind of partially going to do an online school as well as, you know, helping others redo their houses. But that, at least that's something that's that's it's better than basically showing a blank for a year. Right. How do you word it and making it fit more of my profile? What makes sense? 
to have something in there I know is something I need to do as well. Yeah, and the nice thing is, like, like let's say you launch a blog or an Instagram or something like that. You put it up mm-hmm. immediately on your experience, like um, manage Instagram account. Okay. Or just say brand manager of my Instagram account. And that becomes your sort of, like, talking point for hmm. any conversations that you have. Okay. And the great thing about a side project is you get to use it as an excuse to talk to people. Yeah. Say, hey, I have this blog or I have this Instagram account. I'm trying to build it. And I'm looking to connect with leaders in the industry. Would you be open to grabbing coffee and just sharing your experience? And now you're not going in saying, give me a job. You're going in saying, I'm going to learn. I'm going to share your story. And anyone who might come across my blog will now know who you are. So you're actually providing value. Even if there's only 20 people following your account, you're still providing more value than nothing. You know? Yeah. Yep. Well, and, 20, exactly. And 20 so people that know me didn't know exactly. me before. <laughs> And my favorite example of this is I had someone who wanted to get into sports technology. So they, they were a developer. They wanted to get into the sports industry. And I said, go to a sports meetup. They said, there aren't any. And I said, start a sports meetup. They started it. 40 people joined within the first week. They reached out to the CEO of one of the companies they wanted to work for, asked them to be a speaker. The CEO showed up uh, to speak. 10 people showed up in the room. They had a good event. After the event, the CEO said, hey, are you looking for a job right now? Because we might have some openings, and this is a really fun event. Um, so right, that person cool. never even asked for a job. It right. just kind of opened up because they were providing value. So for I, for me, so an example, as, as I'm thinking of companies, as, we're, as I'm hearing kind of what you're saying and, you know, some of the examples is, so for, you know, what comes off to mind, I think, you know, I love Warby Parker. Um, mm-hmm. Under Armour is another company that I think is, again, it, it's kind of came on some hard times, but I think about from where they started to where they're at today from a pure marketing perspective or brand management. I mean, the guy started selling T-shirts out of his trunk of his car mm-hmm. to, build, to build Under Armour what it is today. Um, so to that point is the, don't be industry specific, right? I mean, kind of branch off and get or am I going down the wrong path? It depends. It depends on how I I don't think. Let me put it this way. Creating something is better than creating nothing. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like you're doing the wrong thing, that will that will play itself out over time. Okay. the 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 stuff that doesn't work will eventually just fall away. But if you keep doing something, the stuff that works will stay. Okay, that makes sense. So and so let's say your initial goal is to create five articles on LinkedIn that highlight your five favorite brands. Mm, Okay. So you just listed them. Warby Parker, Harley Davidson. um, What were some of the other ones? Uh, You know, even the, even the Payless one, you know, maybe not your favorite brand, but a pretty cool drive that they just did. Yeah. You, you, you spend an hour a week writing that article it doesn't have to be perfect. And again, uh, this is something you'll probably have to fight with your perfectionism a little bit. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, just just do your first pass. Okay. Maybe have someone read it and then post it. Because it matters more that you're trying than you are like the literary genius of the year, you know? Okay. And this is – because most people will just skim it at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And this is where we enter into our current – marketing um environment which is you want to have quality but quality at a you either have to have the best quality thing ever a couple times a year or the or or a good enough quality every single day it's like the two extremes are kind of where we're playing now i I don't expect you tomorrow to become like mr you know copywriter uh it's it's gonna take time and i think you need to build up to it I'm doing the same thing on my end. You know, I make a video a week. I'm trying to make more, but a video a week is better than what I did last year, two years ago, which was a couple of videos a year. Right. Um, but here's what's going to end up happening is you're going to post that thing. It may or may not get traction, but what's important is that when someone comes to your LinkedIn profile, the first thing they see is, oh, wow, you wrote about War- Warby Parker. I love Warby Parker. Or mm-hmm. even better, I work at Warby Parker. Right. And we're about to have a conversation now and i just got to read your little analysis and and you get to use this as a way to say like you know maybe you even reach out to someone and say hey i I was writing a little thing about your company and i was wondering if you wanted to chat um 
you know, not to be like on record or anything, but just because you're curious and you want to learn. Mm-hmm. And like these are the yep. fun things that kind of result out of it. So, again, okay. I, I don't think you should necessarily go launch a blog or anything huge right now sure. just because it's right. not it's not really your radar. Yep. You definitely write articles and post them on LinkedIn, share updates from the companies that you find most interesting, follow those company profiles on LinkedIn so you can get their updates and keep sharing out their stuff. You want to become visible. And that's the main thing that we want to work on in the short term. Okay. That makes sense. But the great thing about this conversation is that you have a focus. And the focus will help you know who to reach out to, what conversations to have, and what direction to move in so that you can say, well, I talked to three people at Warby Parker, and it just doesn't sound like the place for me. Mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on Harley or something else right now. We interrupt today's episode to let you know about Career Therapy's Unstuck Coaching Program. If you're feeling paralyzed by job search procrastination and unsure of what to do next in your career, we're here to help. Each month as a member, you will get access to two one-on-one coaching calls, unlimited virtual chat with your coach via Slack, invitations to bi-weekly group coaching sessions, and lifetime access to our eight-part job search curriculum. Want to take your search to the next level? Head over to careertherapy.com and schedule a free 15-minute consultation to chat with me today and see if coaching is right for you. Now, back to our show. No, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I like it, too. It's kind of, I mean, of course, it's kind of, I don't, I don't like the word scary, but it's, it, the uncertainty about it, of course, lingers, but it's exciting to think because I, I know I would enjoy it with the right path. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I think the thing that'll make it less scary is going and just talking to a few people. Mm-hmm. Um, if you just have a few conversations, like here, here would be like my favorite way to do it. Um, get coffee with your friend who works at Harley, right? Unfortunately, I'm in Miami. He's in Milwaukee. Oh, well, all right. Do, do a Skype coffee or something. Yeah, yeah, you got it. No. I... And then and then after that call, uh, do a little write up and say, like, here's the top five things that I think Harley does well with their brand. Mm-hmm. short, short, short article, okay. top five things that I think they, and then send it to him and say, Hey, thanks. It was really great chatting with you. Maybe he shares that with a few people inside his company. And, right. and after that conversation with him, ask, is there anyone else at Harley that would be good for me to talk to? Okay. And now you're building a network. And yep. I think that's really what you need to do in the short term. Cause you're not quite sure where you want to end up. Right. Yeah. Wise. Yeah. I mean, and again, I'm very open. I'm not, you know, again, yeah, that's the good part is I'm very open to opportunities. So So you need, you need to be specific on at least two of the three things. That makes sense. Yeah. So if you're open on location, you need to be very specific on the industry and the job title. You, you left your last job and you booked this session for a reason. And that reason is that you really want to be trying new things. Yeah. And the best place, and it's great that you have an interest in this area, but the best place to be staying on top of interesting new trends right now is marketing. Yeah. Yeah. And so the great thing about it, and and, and it is a noisy space. It's not like it's not a noisy space. Um, But the great thing about it is everyone needs marketing. Everyone at the end of the day needs marketing. Heck, half of my job is just helping people with marketing. Yeah. What is interesting about it is you get to choose who you want to help. The skill set is the same. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh, you know, I'm interested in architecture. I guess I have to only build this kind of structure, right? The, The technology is the same. The clients can change. And so what you get to do they say what brands are most interesting to me and then just build your own brand around that. So for me, it was technology and, or, and technology and education and career change. For you, it could be automotive and or, or even more specific, more niche, uh, motorcycles or uh, clothing and fashion or music. Mm-hmm. You, know, yeah. Yeah. you really you really get to choose. But the key thing here is to choose. And I think the main struggle from what I can tell from our conversation that you're going to have is wanting to drift back to opening up more opportunities. I think you need to drill down to the bottom of the well 
before you backtrack. So let's say we start with the motorcycle industry. Before you say, all right, let's open it back up and go talk to Warby Parker and a bunch of other people. Mm-hmm. I want you to exhaust the motorcycle industry. Okay. All right. It makes total how, sense. Yeah. How are you feeling about everything at this point? And what do you think your biggest blocker is going to be? Um, actually, I feel good. I feel really good. Um, I think probably the biggest obstacle will be, um, and, and, I, and I don't think it's fair for me to think that because I'm not even in it yet, is um, kind of two things. Going down the path of, for example, the automotive industry isn't really something I'm interested in, so to speak. But I have to look at it that the goal is not necessarily I want to be in the auto industry. It's to understand what the brand managers, how they kind of feel, how they think, how they look at the brand, right, um, mm-hmm. within the industry. Um and my gut will tell me, is it something I'm really, you know, can, can I can I be passionate about it? Just, and again, I'm going to use the word in this tense, you know, that I'm, I get excited about it. You know, yeah. to, your, to your point, I, I wear Warby Parker. I, I think I, I love the things they do when it comes to product um, display and how they ship their products and the things they do. I, I, I love their stores. I mean, I, their stores, I think, are really cool. Their customer service is fantastic. That doesn't necessarily mean I would enjoy working for them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like I don't know that yet about the automotive industry because I haven't had much exposure to marketing within the automotive industry. So exactly getting over that hump of it may not be quite what I thought it was going in, but I got to give it a little bit of time. And for me, it's always been a challenge is that I am a not a, I'm not a type A, but I'm pretty close for I, I just want things to happen. You know yep. what I mean? And that's that can be, I just got to slow it down and understand that it may not happen in the first 10, 15 conversations. So. And I think you're really hitting it. I think the main thing to keep in mind here, and you said this earlier, is that it's not like this is going to fulfill every bit of your life. This is going to be something that you can find interest in. I'm sorry, there's a big siren going on because I live in Chicago and there's always a big siren. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the main thing here is never to expect an answer. You will never know 100% without a single doubt. Like, it's not like there won't be a day that comes someday, three, four years down the road, where you're like, was this the right choice, right? We will always have those thoughts if we are open-minded, critical thinking people. Mm -hmm. The key is, did I make a decision? Did I move things forward? And if it truly was wrong, what's next? Because the idea that we will ever figure it out before doing it is flawed. We will not figure out if this is right or wrong until we are already six months in and we're like, whoops, this is wrong. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like you might get an inkling early and then be able to jump ship, but then you'll question that decision. Like Mm -hmm. if you're a questioner, you'll always question that's fine the thing is is that you're moving forward because the worst thing is three years from now not having made a decision still looking for a job oh yeah yeah and that's what we're trying to avoid that's hell yeah we're heaven who knows but we know what hell is yeah so if we can get to purgatory so be it if we can get better than purgatory even better but it's a journey there is no end point here. There is only, let's say you can only get into a tire company first. All right. Well, now that I'm at the tire company, how do I get into a Porsche? All mm-hmm. right. Now that I'm at Porsche, how do I get to Tesla? Now that I'm at Tesla, how do I get to whatever's going to replace Tesla? And it's the long-term mindset with the short-term strategy. Yeah. That makes sense. Makes total sense. Awesome. Yep. Um, if anything ever comes up um, that you want to chat about, you are hundred percent always welcome to email me uh, questions chat me whatever it is um, I'm happy to just kind of banter back and forth and help you help you through these things if you ever want to jump on another call also happy to do that um, but I think we've set up at least a good baseline mm-hmm. to focus your activity so um, it sounds like you're in a good place is there anything else that's on your mind that you'd like to, to jump on before we wrap no I think we've covered 
more than I expected. So um, that I'm I, I'm very happy about because I, I think we did cover a lot of ground um, in you know in the first call initial call and you know now it's about kind of putting you know boots on the street so to speak and for me to start you know kind of walking down this path you know this new path so to speak and doing kind of following your guideline. All right. Well, I'm really excited to see where you take it. Please keep me posted and. I'll let you know what ends up happening with this recording down the road. Okay. Fantastic. I appreciate it, Terry. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. If you found this conversation to be helpful, please like and subscribe wherever you are listening. We also appreciate it if you take the time to leave us a review on iTunes. It really does help us spread the word and get these ideas out to more job seekers looking to build their careers and improve their lives just like you. If you'd like to learn more about career therapy and see our different coaching options, you can head over to careertherapy.com to learn more. Thank you again for stopping by. We wish you all the best in the future of your career. Have a good one.